Welcome everybody to the webinar on testosterone treatment of adult men with XXY, uh, brought to you by uh, Dr. Adrian Dobbs of Johns, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and I am thrilled to announce that Dr. Dobbs is heading up the world's second multidisciplinary clinic for X and Y chromosome var variations. This clinic is going to specifically attend to the needs of, the, of adults. It's at Johns Hopkins and um, Dr. Dobbs is going to speak more about this um, during her presentation. But um, they're fully up and running and uh, this clinic now is a complement to the Extraordinary Kids Clinic for um, uh, primarily focused on pediatrics here in Denver, uh, pediatrics and adolescents. Um, as of uh, the, the last few days when Dr. Dobbs got this off the ground, we now have a full spectrum of treatment available in a multidisciplinary clinic environment. So I am going to stop talking and change the presenter to Dr. Dobbs and she will be able to begin the program. And it's all yours, Dr. Dobbs. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Okay, let me just move this over. Okay, so um, thank you very much for <coughs> excuse me for inviting me to uh, give this talk this evening, and uh, I hope that it will be helpful uh, to those uh, listeners. Um, as mentioned, I am at, at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, within the Division of Endocrinology, and we are located in Baltimore, Maryland. I feel a bit of a close affinity to um, individuals who have this syndrome because Dr. Kleinfelter was actually from Baltimore. And uh, I had the honor of meeting him uh, when, uh, when he was alive uh, in the early 80s. So it's always been um, of, uh, a source of uh, interest and it, uh, uh, we, we follow many of these gentlemen at Hopkins. So generally what I'm going to be talking about tonight is uh, a discussion of some medical concerns of men who have Kleinfelter syndrome. Then I'll be talking about the potential benefits of testosterone treatment of hypogonadism. I'll then talk about testosterone treatment options and then I'll end with a discussion of monitoring of men who are on testosterone replacement therapies. So to begin with I want to make sure we all basically understand the overall axis and that here is the hypothalamus which secretes a hormone called GNRH. This stimulates the pituitary gland to um, make uh, several hormones called FSH and LH and these stimulate the testes to make testosterone and sperm. <clears throat> so this is the um, usual testosterone regulation system and um, the issue that's going on in men who have Kleinfelter syndrome is obviously that their testes did not fully develop um, because of hyalinization um, or damage to the seminiferous tubules. So the uh, feedback mechanism is not really there so that the classical laboratory test for, some, for a man with Kleinfelter's is an elevated FSH and LH with a low testosterone level and low spermatozoa. Now when we talk about testosterone, I need to emphasize that when it's measured in the blood, there's actually different components to the testosterone. The total testosterone is made up of that which is free in the blood and that's only by itself about 1 to 2 percent. That which is loosely bound to albumin and there's about 40 to 50 percent of the total and then that which is tightly bound to sex hormone binding globulin and that's about 50 to 60 percent of the total. Bioavailable testosterone is another um, measurable entity and this consists of that which is free and that which is loosely bound to albumin. So when we measure total testosterone, it's really these separate components. Now in men with Kleinfelters, it's fine just to do a total testosterone. That usually provides enough information, but at certain times a free testosterone may be a better test depending on any other comorbidities. The other important point to make about testosterone um, 
measurement is that it is best to measure it in the morning because there is a circadian rhythm. So the epidemiology of a Kleinfeld is, um, uh, has um, the data is slightly varied. Uh, in Denmark, who probably has the best data because everyone is registered there, the prenatal prevalence is in the range of 1.5 to 1,000, and the frequency is about 1 to 660 live deliveries. Um, about 90% of these men are non-mosaic uh, with an X chromosome polysomy. Um, but only 10% are diagnosed before puberty. So there really are estimates that it is a very underdiagnosed condition, and there are estimates that only about 25% are actually diagnosed over the entire course of a man's life. So that is a, a significant challenge, and something that we talk about a lot and society talks about a lot, is that we need to have a, uh, uh, an increased uh, awareness that we are probably under-identifying and under-treating men with Kleinfelters. The pathophysiology of the condition is what is non-disjunction of the X chromosome. That is, the paired X chromosomes fail to separate, and this usually occurs in phase one or two of meiosis. Um, about 10%, uh, it's a post-fertilization non-disjunction. And it's unclear, you know, what really produces this. There are some risk factors that have been reported, and that is advanced maternal or paternal age. But generally, um, it's unclear why this occurs. There's uh, some data that uh, it might have a, a greater uh, frequency in assisted reproductive technology, just, such as IVF. But that really has not been proven, because in many situations, those, in, those couples are older and there may be some confounding effects of age that it's hard to distinguish between the assisted reproductive technology. So this is the classical presentation um, of a gentleman, and this is really the exact patient that was described by Dr. Harry Kleinfelter. A, a tall unicoid body proportions, and clearly the reason for that is because there uh, the testosterone is not at a sufficient level to close the epiphyses, so these men generally have longer, long bones. Uh, they classically have low testosterone, and therefore will have sparse facial and public pubic hair. Um, the pathology is that of small, hard testes. Sometimes there can be a micropenis. There's infertility. Uh, and mild to moderate cognitive deficiency, or rather some auditory processing delay and language dysfunction. Now, when we talk about signs and symptoms, we're really talking about um, where testosterone has its effects based on where there's testosterone receptors. Some of these are physical in that there can be loss of energy and fatigue and osteoporosis because there are testosterone receptors in the bone. Some of them are psychological symptoms, and a mild depression can occur in all men that have low testosterone. And then sexual dysfunction is quite common, where there's decreased sexual desire, and there can be some regression of secondary sexual characteristics and erectile dysfunction. Um, uh, in general, uh, these are some of the complications that are seen in men who have um, Kleinfeld is, and, and, they, and many of these effects are general, meaning they occur in all men who are hypogonadal. When it occurs pre-puberty, testosterone deficiency manifests itself as delayed puberty and tall stature, and delayed puberty is a common presentation of uh, men with Kleinfeld is. Uh, osteoporosis um, can be seen, and the reason for this is testosterone has an important effect to build up bone density. Sexual dysfunction. There's also, also alterations in body composition, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about diabetes, but it turns out that testosterone generally is associated with an increased muscle mass, so that men who have low testosterone will tend to have more fat and less muscle. Um, testosterone deficiency is also associated with a slight decrease in quality of life, and because of the ratio of testosterone to estrogen, Gynecomastia can be observed in men with low testosterone. Um, there is uh, a, an increase in mortality in men that have a Klinefelter syndrome. Um, and this is a, an important uh, realization that 
when we think about men with Klinefelter's, it's not only fertility, it's not only a testosterone deficiency, but there may be other things involved. Uh, in general, the all-cause mortality uh, prevent, uh, results in a median loss of life for about 2.1 years, and this data is from a United Kingdom cohort. Uh, all-cause mortality um, is increased um, by its, this is a, I'm sorry, uh, this is a standardized mortality ratio. Uh, so all-cause mortality is up 1.5, neurological disorders 2.8, renal disease are more commonly seen, femoral, fra femoral fractures are definitely more common because of the osteoporosis. Uh, and coronary artery disease um, is not more commonly seen though in this, in this population. Can you explain what those numbers mean? What, the, what does 1.5 in increased mortality, how, how do you interpret that number? Well, it is, um, what you're doing is you're looking at the mortality of the general population that would be uh, one for something. So 1.5 uh, would translate into how they translate it as 2.1. So it doesn't mean it's a, you have a 50% greater chance of dying from a disease. It's really much less than that. Um, and then two, so the higher the number, the greater the likelihood that one will have this condition. And uh, so femoral fractures is the highest, and there is a, um, maybe the way to look at it is a 39% increase in the risk of developing a femoral fracture compared to someone who does not have Klinefelter syndrome. Thank you. So um, the other way of looking at it is, a, is a, just the, a hazard ratio, and how this works is that, that it turns out that men with Klinefelter syndrome are more likely to be hospitalized. And when they look back as to why they were hospitalized, um, um, there, these are the list of possible causes. Now if, it, um, if this line crosses one, that means that there's no particular increased risk of having, um, having a, uh, um, being hospitalized as a newborn, as an example. <clears throat> crosses one, so it's equal, it's the same as a, as a newborn child that did not have Klinefelter's. But if you look at a blood problem, as an example, it turns out that there is a increased um, risk of being hospitalized because of a blood problem. And you see here, it, it, it doesn't cross one at all. In fact, it's a, a, the hazard ratio is about three. So that means that if one is hospitalized, if um, a man with Klinefelter is, is about three times more likely to be hospitalized for some kind of bleeding problem or, blood, or, or an abnormal blood test than someone who did not have Klinefelter's. And this goes for infections, there's a greater risk of being hospitalized for infection or a neurological problem. Now, um, in general, men who have KS have a poorer health profile than other men. And these are some of the reasons that have been reported. I've already mentioned there's an increased fracture of the femur, the spine, the hip, and the forearm. And this is because of the increased risk of osteoporosis in men who have low testosterone. There's also an increased risk of diabetes and insulin resistance. The reason for this is probably because testosterone is, a, is um, related to muscle and a man that has low testosterone will likely have less muscle and more fat and individuals that have more fat are more likely to have insulin resistance and diabetes. There's also an increased risk of actually dying from breast cancer and this increased risk has been reported as high as 60 fold. Men with Klinefelter's are more likely to have breast cancer, and because it often goes undiagnosed or it's diagnosed quite late, they're more likely to die from it. There's also an increased risk of leg ulcers and leg embolism, uh, and there's thought that there could be some increased propensity to clot. Um, there um, has always been some discussion of whether or not men with KS are more prone to autoimmune diseases such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, um, but statistically this does not seem to be significant. 
Now, um, there's, there's been lots of theories thrown around as to why a man with KS might have an increased mortality compared to a man that was uh, an XY. And uh, the theories, some of them revolve around the fact that there is this extra X that is present. So there is what's called overexpression of uh, non-inactivated genes on this extra chromosome. So basically there is um, two, uh, uh, the two, of the two chromosomes, that's extra X gives you an extra doses of something that may be bad. Um, so that is one explanation. The other explanation is really through um, physiological reasons, and that is the X chromosome might predispose to physiological abnormalities. For example, the low testosterone or higher estrogen, which could themselves confer risk, such as diabetes, breast cancer, and deep vein thrombosis. So it either could be uh, a genetic abnormality because it is now two X's, uh, or it could be due to physiological reasons of the low testosterone. Now, talking about diabetes, um, it, um, diabetics, uh, someone who with KS is, is uh, more likely to have diabetes. Uh, in uh, some uh, previous reports, looking at this, about 15 percent, 39 percent, and here's a 3.9 percent three, 3 of the population. Uh, of KS men had diabetes. Um, now whatever, even though there's a great deal of variability here, it's still much higher than the general prevalence in the population, which is 1.2 percent. Um, there's been some studies uh, about glucose tolerance and what testosterone does to this, and, um, and I would have to say at this time this is a little bit debatable as to whether or not testosterone will uh, decrease the um, likelihood of diabetes uh, if one starts treatment early on, and this is just not clear at this time. Um, now, when you uh, this is a study uh, that did report an increased risk of diabetes, uh, impaired fasting glucose, and uh, well, it's all metabolic syndrome in KS. So this this is a group of subjects who have KS, and here's a group of a control subjects. Um, and this is the percent of men that were affected. The total sample size was 70. And you see that the, um, this is all, all these states of glucose intolerance was more common uh, in the KS subjects than it was in the control subjects. And here's diabetes, impaired fasting glucose, uh, diabetes or, um, uh, or impaired uh, fasting glucose, and then the yellow is metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome, as, as you know, is a compilation of many uh, signs and symptoms. Usually there's elevations in triglycerides, there is abdominal obesity, there's hypertension, um, and there is um, uh, an increased risk for cardiac disease. So in KS patients, this is all more common than it is in a control group. Um, now, this change in body composition, this increase in visceral adiposity, uh, also results in an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. These changes in body composition refer to an increased truncal fat, an increase in waist circumference, both of which confer an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Uh, and in those men who have metabolic syndrome, there is a reduction in left ventricular systolic and diastolic function. And there's an increased risk of fatty liver. Uh, people have called this NASH, non-alcoholic steatorrheic hyper, um, um, uh, hyperlipidemia. And these are uh, conditions in which the, um, there's insulin resistance. And this usually is from the fact that there's increased uh, waist circumference. And the debate is whether or not this is simply an effect of testosterone absence or whether or not there's an addition of some underlying genetics in this population of men. You know, I always uh, think about that that is probably bi-directional. And what I mean by that is that men with low testosterone are more likely 
to become obese and have some insulin resistance. And similarly, obesity can worsen the testosterone levels. Um, so here's a, a, a gentleman that has low testosterone because in KS the testes are not making sufficient amounts. This results in changes in body composition, which is a decrease in muscle mass and increase in fat, and that obviously leads to insulin resistance. And it turns out that men that have a lot of obesity, they have a, um, an increase in their aromatase enzyme, and, ends, and this enzyme converts testosterone to estrogen. So this further worsens the picture in that a man with KS will not only have low testosterone causing obesity, but the obesity causes an increase in estrogen levels. Now, I mentioned that there's a little bit of a debate about whether or not there's a propensity for autoimmune diseases in men with KS, and the thought here is that this could be to hormonal abnormalities, chromosomal or immunologic. The hormonal abnormalities that may cause this is that there's chronic estrogen stimulation, and that may stimulate antibodies. There can also be the, chrom the underlying chromosomal abnormalities, and that patients with chromosomal aberrations generally have a higher incidence of auto autoimmune antibodies. And there could also be an immunological abnormality with decrease in CD4s to a CD8 ratios. Um, I thought we'd uh, talk about a particular about a patient here just to start um, some of the discussion. And this is a 53-year-old man with KS who presents with gynecomastia at age 18 and has decreased his height by one inch since he was a young adult. And um, so this is an, uh, the questions or the options here that I want you to think about as we go forward with the discussion is that um, he, the fact that he has gynecomastia, which means he may not be sufficiently treated, he may have low testosterone and increased estrogen causing the gynecomastia and the fact that he has decreased his height would suggest that he could have some osteoporosis. So with that, um, these might be some choices to think about. Uh, make sure that he is taking sufficient amounts of testosterone replacement therapy, and this will help to uh, decrease the uh, gynecomastia. And the other might be to get a DEXA scan to document how much osteoporosis he had. In severe cases, one might even add a bisphosphonate. And the uh, C would also be to start calcium and vitamin D. And this is a pretty typical uh, situation of a middle-aged man um, who uh, is on testosterone but may not be sufficiently treated. And um, I always really want to highlight the issue of bone density in men because it's very related to muscle strength. Here is uh, on the uh, x-axis is a measure of muscle uh, strength in the arm, and here is bone mineral density in the forearm. Um, and this bone mineral density is measured by a DEXA scan, which is a commonly used nuclear medicine procedure. Uh, women get DEXA scans all the time to look to see whether or not they have osteoporosis. We generally uh, don't use it as much in men, and I think that's a, a, a pity. We really should be using it much more because osteoporosis is definitely a problem in men with KS. But what you see here is that in men who have low bone mineral density, this is in many ways a marker for low testosterone, and that uh, and testosterone is generally an anabolic hormone that helps with muscle. And here, low bone mineral density equals low bone st muscle strength arm. Same thing here, high bone mineral density is associated with men who have a greater um, muscle mass. Um, and all in all, the epidemiology shows that there's a decreased bone mass in 25 to 48% of men with KS. And true osteoporosis is seen in 60 to 15 percent. Uh, 40 percent of KS men have decreased bone density or osteoporosis, either one. So this is a significant, really, uh, public health problem to uh, men with KS. Um, the reasons uh, to have low bone mineral density include low testosterone. Um, 
and there's a direct effect of, on the androgen receptor. Testosterone usually binds to the androgen receptor on the bone, and that causes an increase in bone density. But also um, the fact that on the bone there are estrogen receptors, and um, if there's low testosterone, there may be insufficient amounts of estrogen that can be aromatized uh, and have an effect on benefiting the bone density. Low vitamin D, it turns out this is really quite common uh, in the general population. We don't go out in the sun anymore. We use um, sun blockers, um, and so this is common in this population as well. And this unfavorable fat to muscle ratio with reduced lean body mass, that is reduced muscle mass. And muscle has the ability to pull on the tendons of the bone. And when anything pulls on the bone, that, she, that stress on the bone causes increased bone growth to occur. So that's why any a man or a woman in whom the diagnosis of osteoporosis is made, it's important to encourage them to do more muscle building exercises such as weights, anaerobic exercises, because one wants to um, increase the, the, the pulling on the tendons of the bone. Now I want to say a few words about cancer. Uh, again, this is an increased mortality index, so there's a, about a 20% a, um, a increase in all um, cancer mortality. Um, this is due to lung, I've already mentioned breast, but there's also an increased risk of lymphomas, which is a blood um, dyscrasia, and there's no increased uh, risk, in fact, there's some protection for prostate cancer. Men with um, KS, generally because they have had lower testosterone levels over a lifetime, uh, have a lower risk of developing prostate cancer than does um, uh, a man who does not have KS. The reasons for tumor um, are also sort of been divided into whether or not this is a chromosomal abnormality or a hormonal abnormality that increases the propensity to tumors. <clears throat> the argument for chromosomal is that if you have one chromosomal problem, you may have another chromosomal problem. Uh, so that some uh, and some cancers are associated with chromosomal abnormalities. Hormonal uh, abnormalities can also cause uh, tumors in that light, these lytic cells are under continuous maximum stimulation by the gonadotropins. Remember in Kleinfelter's there is a reduction in testosterone, um, with a, a, redu a, a, um, a hyalinization of the seminiferous tubules, and this results in elevations in FSH and LH, and that stimulates the testes and runs the risk that this can develop into tumors. Breast cancer, there's a 7.5% prevalence of breast cancer in KS men, a 50-fold increased risk of developing breast cancer in males relative to other men. Um, the median age, though, is lower, is higher, excuse me. So why is it important to have early diagnosis of men with KS? One is um, uh, the issue of whether or not it's a, uh, it's a need for language therapy. I know that you have, there's whole sessions that you've had that are devoted to issues of uh, learning and uh, disabilities and processing, but this would be one example where uh, early initiation of language therapy would be important. It's important to monitor pubertal changes. There is discussion of a uh, possibility of preserving fertility. Certainly the initiation of testosterone replacement therapy needs to be discussed early on um, in the early stages of puberty so that that opportunity is not missed. Uh, one needs to think about to attain peak bone mass. Uh, peak bone mass occurs in the late 20s uh, and if the, 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 the man may not be given that opportunity if he has not had high doses, or, or, or I would say just usual doses of testosterone in his teenage years. And then lastly, early diagnosis is important to prevent some of the comorbidities that I've mentioned, such as diabetes and heart disease. 
Um, we do um, counsel patients about this, that comorbidities increase an increased risk of vein thrombosis. It's important, particularly if one is using testosterone, to avoid erythrocytosis, which is excess red, uh, red blood cells. There's some increased risk of uh, tumors in the testes. Uh, men should learn how to do a self-breast exam. Uh, it's important to maintain normal weight loss and cardiovascular disease risk factor control. Fertility is possible. Bone health is important. And the testosterone re um, replacement therapy should be initiated when either the LH is elevated or the testosterone is low. All right, so I'd next like to talk about the benefits uh, and what do we know and what don't we know about uh, treatment with testosterone. Um, there are things we know for sure, and the things we know for sure is that of masculinization. Giving testosterone will, call, will result in full masculinization of the man, beard growth, lowering of the voice, because testosterone thickens the vocal cords, axillary hair, pubic hair, musculature, that definitely occurs. Increased bone mineral density absolutely occurs. There are testosterone receptors on the bones. Um, giving testosterone will result in increased bone mass. Uh, here's an increase in muscle mass and reduced fat mass, uh, and this is um, a possible prevention or improvement in glucose tolerance and diabetes, and this is a possibility. And testosterone is, is associated with an improved sense of well-being, and that's exactly what the sentiment is, is people that just feel better. Um, I want to show an example of testosterone's effect on the bone. Uh, on the left is a uh, man who um, has normal testosterone levels, and you see there's a lot of white, which refers to thick bone. And on the right uh, um, is a man that has very low testosterone levels. These men are the same age. They were both around 30. And in this situation, uh, the fact that there's less white refers to the fact that there is a lower bone density. And there have been several studies now to give testosterone to men to show that there is a significant increase in their bone mineral density. These are men that were treated over a 40-month period. Uh, in the green and the yellow, these men were given testosterone versus a placebo. And it turns out that there's clearly an increase in lumbar, in lumbar spine bone mineral density in those men who were given testosterone. Um, diabetes, I mentioned the increased risk of diabetes in men with Klinefelters. This study I'm showing was not done in men who had Klinefelters. It was done in men who had low testosterone for another reason. And what they looked at here is a, a measure of hormone resistance. They call this a HOMA-IR. And they randomized men either to placebo or to uh, testosterone. And what they found is that there was a reduction in insulin resistance. That means that men became more sensitive to uh, the insulin that they were getting when they were given testosterone compared to men that were given placebo. So it's a nice example. Again, not a KS population specifically, but a hypogonadal population in which testosterone was beneficial in men who had diabetes. Now, another benefit is that of muscle strength, and um, there are four graphs on this page, and the way this is organized is that it turns out that men were treated for six months with testosterone, and then it was stopped. And I want to call your attention to this upper left, and this is knee extensor strength. So what you see here is that for the first six months, the men were on therapy, and they were randomized either to testosterone or to placebo. Uh, the placebo was in red. The testosterone is in yellow. And you see there was an increase in strength that occurred. Uh, and then after it was stopped, there it went back down to baseline here. Uh, and here is, again, muscle strength compared to a uh, progressive decline uh, in men that were given placebo. And here is muscle mass. When given testosterone, there is an increase in muscle mass. If the testosterone is stopped, there is a fall back down to baseline. 
and here is placebo again where there was no change in red. So the point about this is that testosterone did increase muscle mass, it did increase strength, but once it, if the testosterone is stopped, the benefit goes away. And it emphasizes the importance of persistence and adherence to testosterone therapy in men who uh, require it. All right, so um, the rest of my talk, I'd like to talk about actual treatment options, and then I'll talk about what monitoring needs to be done. This is generally the current forms of testosterone that are on the market. Uh, and the types are injections, patches, or gels. Um, the injections they have um, an advantage. They are definitely inexpensive, and it is definitely absorbed, so it's effective in relieving symptoms. The problems with it is that there are superphysiological fluctuations. There's this roller coaster effect. It can be painful, and for some men who are unable to administer it themselves, it requires an office visit. Patches, um, these are placed on non scrotal skin, on regular skin. It's placed at night. The levels tend to mimic the normal diurnal rhythm because they, the levels peak in the morning. Um, the problem with it is that uh, it is visible, but mainly the problem is there's a great deal of skin irritation. And then there's a whole list of gels, and I'm going to talk uh, again uh, about gels, the different kinds. But generally, these maintain testosterone concentrations over a 24-hour period. Um, that's the major pro to this. The pro con to this is that there are concerns regarding transference. That is that the testosterone, which is sitting on the skin, can be transferred to another person if there is skin-to-skin -skin rubbing in some way. So this is the pharmacokinetics of the testosterone. Here is the red of injections. You see the levels get very high in the first couple of days, and then they begin to fall. So another injection is up and down, up and down, and that is this roller coaster effect. Gels, however, stay fairly stable uh, and stay within the normal uh, range. Now, there are several different types of gels that are on the market. It really has gotten quite confusing. Um, and I've listed them here. Uh, something is called Fortesta. Uh, it's placed on the front and inner thighs. It comes in a canister. And there's a starting dose of 40 milligrams. Androgel is made in two different concentrations, a 1% and a 1.62%. It's applied to the upper arms. It also comes in these pumps. Testum is applied to the um, uh, upper arms. Now this, by the way, so testum is a 1% and Fortester is a 2%. Um, the reason uh, drug companies wanted to do this is because the more concentrated something is, generally the less volume is required. So they found that most men uh, prefer to take a more concentrated solution. They didn't think it was as messy. There's also something called Axeron. This is a solution, and it's, uh, poor, it's uh, applied under the upper arm. And then there was patches, and this is uh, patches are placed on the back, the abdomen, the upper arms, or the thigh. And it's important to rotate the sites. And there are different strengths of patches that are available. This is the uh, pharmacokinetics of uh, Andrew Gel, and it comes in a more concentrated formulation as a 1.62%. It's applied daily to the upper arms or the shoulder. And this is the level over a 24-hour period. Uh, this, this, this was the baseline of men who had low testosterone that were about 250. Um, when given testosterone, the level stayed quite nicely uh, in the 700 kinds of range. And once it was stopped at 24 hours, the level goes back down to normal over, um, in the, next, uh, over the next day. This is for Testa. They can, this comes in a pump similar to uh, Andro, uh, Androgel. It's clear, colorless, odorless, alcohol-based. It comes in a travel size so that one can take it on an airplane. And each pump of the canister delivers about 10 milligrams of testosterone, which is equal to about a half a gram of gel. Uh, and this is a 2% concentration. 
the recommended starting dose is 40 milligrams or, or four pumps. That'd be two compressions on each leg. And this is the pharmacokinetics of for tester. It's placed here at zero time. It generally peaks in about four hours uh, and it stays fairly much in the normal range throughout the 24-hour period. Um, Axeron um, is a solution that's uh, placed under the arms and uh, the levels stay um, fairly uh, within the normal range. Notice there's pretty much a wide standard deviation uh, and that's why it's so important to monitor the blood test to make sure that the man is taking the appropriate amount of testosterone. But again, it's a 24-hour medication and it stays pretty much within the normal range over a 24-hour period. Um, there's also something called Testapel. It's a pellet. Um, therefore, it's, we're out of the gels here. The patients initially receive four to ten subcutaneous testosterone pellets. With subsequent doses and planting, they, you, uh, uh, generally it uh, needs to be um, new pellets need to be put in on four month, three to four month intervals. The mean testosterone uh, level uh, in a study prior to treatment was 108 nanograms per deciliter and then this increased to 325 to 587 um, during the treatment of the testapel. Um, and all, all patients received some increased number of pellets at some point in their care. So this is a a study in which they used Testapel in men who had KS. These are four men. This is months from baseline in, in all of these patients. And uh, in the um, uh, triangle are the numbers of, te of, the, of the pellets used and the, uh, uh, the circles are the, is the testosterone level. So as you see in patient one, Basically, he needed about nine to ten pellets placed every two to three months to attain a normal testosterone level. And here is um, the same thing for another patient with KS, is that they required about nine pellets. Here again, nine pellets, and here about three to six pellets. So it is an option. The advantage of a testosterone pellet is that it's placed under the skin, this pellet, and it secretes testosterone over about a three-month period. So it's good for men who ex expect to have poor compliance and not take their testosterone daily. And this is an important point, is that there needs to be persistence in taking the testosterone. Uh, because it turns out that many, many men with KS do not take their medications. Uh, and here is the testosterone level in three different groups. This is an untreated man with KS. This is a treated man with KS. But this is the control group of men that do not have KS, emphasizing the point that even a man who's treated sometimes is not treated sufficiently when compared to the control group. The same would be seen for LH, is that the LH levels would normally be in the low in this range. Um, as an evident, but here you see men who have had, who are treated with KS, and yet they uh, have an elevated LH. And here's men untreated, untreated who have a very high LH levels. So the, when we're under treating men with testosterone, as evidenced by a lower testosterone level and a um, higher LH level. All right, so those are the treatment options, and I'm just going to end uh, with um, the monitoring that should be done in this population. These are some of the potential risks of testosterone therapy, acne, uh, edema in patients who have pre-existing cardiac, renal, or hepatic disease, gynecomastia. There's a very theoretical discussion about prostate. There can be some increase in uh, red blood cells, and there can be possibly sleep apnea. The relation between prostate cancer really has been excluded. Uh, and this is just shown here. If you look at older men, these are the men that are more prone to get prostate cancer. It increases dramatically with age. But this is exactly at the same time that testosterone is actually falling. So the proof or that testosterone may be related to an increase in prostate cancer is, is really unfounded. This, however, is real. 
It turns out that testosterone can increase the production of red blood cells, and this is particularly the case with intramuscular testosterone therapy. So here is hematocrit, and these are men that were treated over a 24-hour period. Those men who were given inject, injection, I'm sorry, intramuscular testosterone, um, they were more likely to have high hematocrits than those men who were placed on, on transdermal testosterone. So any man who uh, is placed on testosterone, particularly a man on intramuscular, needs to have their hemoglobin and hematocrit measured very frequently. So the, um, in fact, there have been several sort of meta-analyses to see what is the risk of developing a high hematocrit if a man is on testosterone. And this is particularly a problem in the elderly, uh, in which it turns out in these multiple studies, the uh, hematocrit was elevated, so that the relative risk for hematocrit greater than 50 percent um, is elevated, and it's actually three and a half times more likely that a man would have a high crit. So this is something that needs to be monitored carefully. So this is the patient monitoring during testosterone therapy. At baseline and pretreatment, a hemoglobin hematocrit. Uh, if a man is above uh, yeah, 55, a PSA, a digital rectal exam, testosterone, prolactin, FSH, LH, ask about voiding symptoms, and a DEXA scan should be done um, to uh, determine if there's osteoporosis. Generally, once treatment is started, it, ne it needs to document that the man is on the appropriate dose, and that is done by measuring a total testosterone level. And then after six, every, uh, in six months, and then after that every year, it would be the same thing. Always uh, assess whether or not there's improvement in some symptoms with men with testosterone. Ask questions about uh, voiding symptoms, and then measure the serum testosterone level again. So in conclusion, testosterone deficiency is associated with clinical signs and symptoms that involve many organs. Testosterone therapy is recommended for men with Klinefelter syndrome. There are numerous options now available for testosterone replacement therapy. And lastly, long-term monitoring should be done to ensure and to prevent metabolic disorders. So I want to close with a little bit of an, uh, let's call it advertising perhaps, is that Johns Hopkins uh, has um, opened up a uh, Kleinfelter Center. Um, we uh, have visited and uh, taken lots of suggestions from the exceptional um, clinic in uh, Denver, uh, which specializes in children. Uh, we see both children and adults uh, in a multidisciplinary um, uh, clinic situation. The, in the, the other health care providers we have that's part of the team is myself as an, as an adult endocrinologist, David Cook, who is a pediatric endocrinologist, uh, pra Dr. Pravin Rao, who is a urologist, um, Dr. Cynthia Monroe, who is a um, psychologist that specializes in this area. We also have a primary care physician as well. So. Um, uh, if it is at Johns Hopkins, uh, you can call my office or there's my email here if you want any further information. The scheduling is done through what's called Hopkins USA, which is this concierge type service for men who have Kleinfelters in which we will be able to make multiple appointments for you um, on the, uh, during the same um, visit. So again, I thank, um, I thank you all for listening. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, this or uh, the Kleinfelter Center, um, even after the call, please do not hesitate to contact me. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Dobbs. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, I uh, want to point out that we really have uh, a remarkable situation here. We have one question, which is a testament <laughs> to how incredibly clear your presentation has been. Um, and I'm going to remind you that uh, Brian. That Chloe question, right? Right, and um, I'm going to open Brian's mic because he he has a, a fairly detailed question and comment, and so I'll start with that. Then I have some questions that I'd like to put in, sort of generic questions that I know others have asked over time, and then. Um, 
to one of our uh, one of our board members, uh, Ginny Cover, who is the author of the uh, the guidebook, is with us, and Ginny may also have some okay. questions. But I'm going to start with Brian's question, and Brian, if you are ready, your mic is open. Brian, are you there? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Hi, doctor. Hi. 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 I've been on clomiphene uh, for about 14 years, on and off. Um, it's amazing. I haven't had to use any of the gels um, because I'm a mosaic. Right. 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 Um, I've always had a little bit higher levels of testosterone naturally. Yeah. Uh, I've had um, hair, pubic hair, uh, since I was real, real young. Um, but I was wondering, ha has clomiphene been used as treatment for right. any exoesquelated patients? Right. So clomiphene, um, it's also called Clomid, is a is a pill. It's a medication that is given um, uh, to. Uh, it can be used in men or women, and it works at the level of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland to stimulate the production of FSH and LH. So in turn, if you're you know, going down the anatomy line here, <clears throat> the, the increase in FSH and LH will stimulate the testes to make sperm and to make testosterone. And in women, it's used to induce ovulation. Um, again, the same mechanism, it's stimulating the pituitary gland, which in turn stimulates the ovaries. Now, in, we hardly use a Clomid at all in men, um, and the reason for this is that uh, it doesn't work that well to increase sperm in a man without um, Kleinfeldtis. So, it's not, it's not, we use it sometimes, but it's not commonly used. Um, if uh, a man is interested, just needs the testosterone, then testosterone is the best way of doing it. Uh, just give that. That's the real stuff, so to speak. The only times we use Clomid is when we're thinking about fertility and in, in a situation in which we really need that man to make his own FSH and LH from the pituitary gland so that that will stimulate the testes to make sperm. Now, in most men with Kleinfeld, is, it's not an issue. Their testes cannot make testosterone, cannot make sperm. So Clomid would not be used in the vast majority of men with Kleinfeld. Is. Now, because you're a mosaic, I think that explains why it may be working. Um, and if it works, then I think it's great because it's given as a pill, so that's a big advantage. Um, but again, the goal is what's the testosterone level? And if you can get there with Clomid, that's great. If you can't, then I would recommend using the gel or another kind of testosterone. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Okay. you really, um, one other, but one other statement. I was using it for um, hoping to find a viable sperm. Yeah. Right. Was there? Did it work for that? No. No. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Uh, it's. Uh, it's very rare that it really works to increase uh, spermatogenesis. Okay. So if it works for you for testosterone. That's great. Great, thank you so much. Okay. I have uh, I have another question in writing here. Uh, does testosterone treatment increase the chance for stroke? Okay, so uh, there is no data to say that testosterone increases the risk of stroke. Now, it's a it's a reasonable question because um, in very high doses, the testosterone could increase hematocrit levels. And when men have very high hematocrit levels, there is some relationship to stroke. Um, but remember, when we talk about testosterone replacement therapy, we're just talking about normal replacement. We're not talking about high doses. And in normal replacement, particularly when it's given as a transdermal product, such as a gel, it is unlikely uh, to raise the hematocrit levels. 
uh, but it is recommended that any man on testosterone should be monitored to ensure that his hematocrit levels do not rise. And if they do rise above 52 percent, then the testosterone should be decreased. Or uh, the other alternative that is used sometimes is that they should donate blood to bring the hematocrit down. So no, it doesn't, there's no data to say it causes a stroke. However, it is important to monitor the hematocrit. Okay, uh, I see other questions coming in uh, being typed, but uh, Jenny, did you have any questions? And I'm just, yes, Jenny, your microphone is open. So, Jenny, you just uh, chime in. If you have questions, you can unmute your phone or whatever. And in the meantime, uh, I am going to, uh, yeah, Brian is typing some other questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on a couple that um, I'd like to just cover from a more general perspective because these okay. discussions do come up. Um, the, the first is in Testum there is a, a perhaps an urban legend, I'm not sure. The Testum can, contains a pheromone uh, yes. that may be uh, attractive to women but antagonistic to other men. Well, um, there is a, um, a slight odor to um, Testum. It, it's a glyco, glyco something um, that um, is in the chemical. Um, the, the, this, 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 oh, this fragrance, I'll use the real word fragrance, some men, they don't even smell it, doesn't bother them. Uh, some men, they find it annoying and they don't like it and it's a cause for them to change. Um, it's not a male-female thing. Uh, one, it doesn't attract or discourage either one. It's really a personal preference, just like perfume is a personal preference. Um, there's nothing um, uh, really hormonal about it. It's simply a chemical. And the manufacturers of Testum have kept it in because they have stated that this helps in the transmission of testosterone and its absorption into the skin. And the FDA um, actually said that it was unique um, and it's, uh, they have approved it in some way as having some kind of uh, biological equivalence, they call it. Um, so supposedly the pharmacists are not allowed to interchange. So if you write a prescription for testum, it's supposed, they're supposed to get testum. If you write a prescription for something else, androgen is supposed to get something else, but that's not always the case. But there's nothing magical about uh, male or femaleness about this. It's a matter of personal preference regarding the fragrance. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is about aromatase inhibitors. There are some doctors who are experimenting with off-label use of uh, aromatase inhibitors to, uh, to assist with uh, testosterone levels, especially during the fertility, assisted fertility. Do, do you have any comments on that? Um, yes. Um, so um, aromatase inhibitors, um, what they do, aromatase is the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. So if, they, if one blocks that enzyme with an inhibitor, then there's a few things that will happen. One is that the estrogen level will fall because you're not converting it into estrogen. The other is there will be a slight increase in the testosterone level. And the third is it sort of goes into the feedback loop so that there might be an increase in the pituitary um, gonadotropin hormones. Now, aromatase inhibitors are used quite frequently uh, in men and in women who have cancers. Because in that situation, for example, a woman who has breast cancer, um, you want to do everything you can to drop that estrogen level. So it's commonly used in that population. And it's also used in men with prostate cancer. Um, I do not think it has any role in men who have uh, Klinefelters. And the reason is a few. The first thing is that a dramatic drop in estrogen can be dangerous in the long run, particularly because of bone. I've mentioned that testosterone is very effective at the level of bone, but estrogen is also very needed to maintain bone mineral density. So blocking 
the conversion of testosterone to estrogen will lower estrogen and result in significant osteoporosis in the long term. So we really discourage its use for the long term. You can lower the dose, you know, take a half a strength, let's say, of the aromatase inhibitor. But again, the, if the man is on testosterone, he needs the real stuff. Um, and giving this inhibitor can be dangerous to the bone. Now, it is used um, for in those um, situations of uh, an attempt for fertility. And then it's part of a formal protocol, and then I think it has a role. Okay. Um, well, this segues into the next question, and um, one of the one of the uh, registrants is asking along these lines as well. So, um, you touched on this. If you could elaborate just a little more about the preservation of fertility uh, during the process where um, a, a, a young man might be trying to conceive. Uh, right, right. and how you manage that. And I'm going to yeah. throw in this question from uh, the mom who's talking about a 19-year-old son. And um, he was taken off T entirely right. because he was going to do a T's uh, uh, sperm extraction. Right, and right. Um, his, his T level now is about uh, 200, which I know there are various scales and so forth. So I'll stop right. talking and let yeah, you yeah. explain. All right. So um, it, the uh, fertility for a man with Kleinfeld is is difficult, and it's difficult because um, the the having this extra X chromosome um, uh, has a uh, the the manifestation of this is that the testes. Um, on, uh, have not fully developed the way they should be. There have been some um, studies that show that there actually is a possibility of sperm very early on, because it turns out that, that things look pretty normal in those early years. And the destruction of the testes occurs probably around the time of puberty. So there's been a few centers around the world that have tried to get sperm very early on in puberty, um, at the age of like 12 or 13. And um, that sperm they tried to get by um, a semen analysis, which means that the, uh, the individual needs to masturbate and the sperm is gotten and frozen. So there may be sperm in that time, but it's a tough time to get. These kids are... Uh, you know, not really, uh, you know, they're 12 years old, they haven't really gone through much puberty, and here you're asking them to get a semen analysis. But there are places around the world that have attempted to do that. The more common situation is trying to, um, through microdissection, trying to get immature sperm, but sperm directly from the testicles themselves. And in that situation, it needs to be done in very specialized centers, um, and there are a few around the country, using a formal protocol to try to stimulate the FSH and LH to maximum amounts. And in that, uh, those protocols, it does involve stopping the testosterone and also using aromatase inhibitors. But I would not recommend doing that unless it's part of a formal protocol, because it does require the microdissection. It's not going to come from ejaculate, from an ejaculate. Am I safe in assuming that if a person is going to pursue assisted reproduction, they, one criterion they should uh, really stress is expertise in XXY? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, and I, I, you know, I, you know, we're doing it at Hopkins. I'm sure you know that they're doing it at Cornell, um, you know, and they're uh, they're doing it in Denmark. So there are places that do it, but it's it's a very specialized technique, a difficult, a technically difficult technique, and um, I, you know, I think you have to be very careful about doing. Any kind. I mean, we're talking. You know, these are invasive procedures at the level of the testes, 
uh, where the surgery is being done, and you want someone that um, is experienced and know what they're doing. I agree with what you're saying. Uh, I'm getting to the end of my canned questions here. Um, we have a group of constituents who are 47XXY and who have gender identity issues. Uh, many of them use the term intersex, although probably more accurately the term would be transgender. Uh, but aside from the terminology of their movement, um, it, it, many of them reject testosterone therapy. So for an individual who refuses testosterone, right. what are the options to, do, to maintain overall good health? Right, right. Well, first of all, you know, we um, there's no data to say that men who have um, uh, Kleinfelters have uh, have an increased likelihood of being either homosexual or having transgender or being transsexual is the term. Um, so, but these things are common in the population. We don't know what it is. It just, it, but it definitely exists, and we feel that it's uh, an open. Uh, um, you know, there's there's just a lot of things we don't understand, and transgender is certainly being accepted and um, treated and uh, as, as much as possible. So, if there is uh, a man who um, uh, happens to uh, be transgender, then he uh, needs to be treated for that and the decision needs to be made. The problem is it's not just stopping the testosterone, it, it would be transitioning to female hormones. And that requires, again, a, um, you know, going to uh, physicians, going to certain centers that feel comfortable and know the various protocols that are used for um, the treatment of transgender. But I want to emphasize again that it is not, um, you know, men with XXY are not, um, uh, don't, do not have a higher incidence. That Y chromosome makes the man a man. And the presence of that extra X just makes, it makes, several metabolic problems and several differences in the development of the testes, but there's no data to say that transgender uh, identity, gender dysphoria, there's a few st uh, uh, phrases that have been used for this, is more common in that population. Uh, but um, the answer is not stopping the testosterone. The answer is deciding what is the best hormonal treatment that should be used. Okay, well, that's that's what we were striving for is is to be able to serve these individuals who are essentially refusing testo um, based on their belief that it that's appropriate for them, and then advising them on how to maintain good health in lieu of that. And I know that may, presents a challenge. Right. Um, the uh, an, another common statement we get uh, from our discussion groups is that when uh, a person is getting the right dose, they can feel it. They can feel that sweet spot when they're in it. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does make sense. Um, it, a lot of um, uh, men can really see a difference when they're treated. Uh, and it's funny, sometimes they, uh, you know, sometimes you'll meet a man who's untreated and they say, I feel okay, you know, nothing wrong, nothing, you know, I'm okay. And that's really part of the underdiagnosis and undertreatment that we face. But they think they feel okay. And only when they're treated, they say, oh my gosh, I can't believe how different I feel. Um, so there truly is a, a difference that men can feel. Now then they get used to maybe this sweet spot and they, they just stay there. Um, but uh, the, the, you know, when, when the beginning, when you first start to treat men, they really do feel a difference. Uh, with injectable testosterone, when the levels get extremely high, a lot of men can, uh, that sometimes they don't like that feel. They get a little irritable and then when the levels get low, 
the levels, uh, um, the person, man feels a little bit down in the dumps, there's a little bit of reduction in sexual function. And that's why I don't really like injectables testosterone that much because it's not very physiological and would prefer a transdermal gel because it keeps men fairly stable and you don't get those rapid swings. But definitely most men can really tell when they'll uh, make, it makes a difference when they're being treated. Okay, last generic question. Um, the um, KSNA serves essentially all the X and Y chromosome variations, and obviously hypogonadism doesn't play a role in all of them. And so there are many things in common. In fact, uh, Brian asked a question about executive function and how testosterone affects that. But I'm interested first in if you were to put some perspective to the role of hypogonadism in Klinefelter syndrome versus other SCAs, how would you characterize that? Um, well, there's other things going on. Um, in, um, uh, in XXY, it is not just the testosterone problem. Uh, it's a big contributor, um, and testosterone will remedy or help with many of the problems associated with low testosterone, but there are other unique things of a man who's XXY that has that is not the testosterone related. And an example of this is the, uh, uh, is the learning disability. Um, there's no uh, proof to say that testosterone will do away with whatever that learning disability is. So there are other things besides, um, besides the testosterone. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So I, now I'm going to, we're, we're down to just a couple of questions from the sure. audience. And, um, and Brian asked about, how testosterone affects executive function, if it does? Well, um, it, it's not clear. I think the data is, is fairly mixed. Um, there are differences in uh, men and women, boys and girls. Um, and as an example, um, visual spatial relationships are easier for boys um, versus girls who are better at word fluency. Uh, and this shows up even in the SATs, you know, the high school tests. Um, boys do better in the math and girls do better in the verbal. Um, so there, there may be differences in how we learn. Um, now that doesn't mean that men should be architects and women should be politicians. It just means that we may learn differently. And there have been a few studies, and we've done these as well, to determine whether or not this is mediated through the hormones. Um, you know, if you give testosterone, will it improve visual spatial? Um, and uh, it, it, the results are mixed. I have to say it, it uh, does not have a huge effect. Uh, it's almost like the question, can, should estrogen be given to prevent dementia in older women? There's no data that that's the case at all. Um, I think that we need to maintain healthy hormones, um, but um, the the way the brain processes processes uh, things um, may be fixed uh, and not related to hormones at least. Uh, you know, so it's the whole thing that we all have learning disabilities. We just have to figure out how to deal with them, and um, I and I um, it's not clear that the testosterone is going to remediate the kinds of uh, processes that, that exist in XXYs. Yeah, um, Brian's last question is, uh, how do we avoid, uh, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, erythrocytosis? Yeah, yeah. So erythrocytosis is a condition of having too many red blood cells. And red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow, which is sort of deep inside the bones. And um, it is, um, and red blood cells are produced in response to um, a, chemo a uh, protein called erythropoietin. So it turns out that testosterone increases erythropoietin production, and that in turn increases red blood cell production. And that's why men generally have higher hematocrits than women do.
because of the testosterone. So giving too much testosterone can result in too much erythropoietin and then too much red blood cell production. Um, now, in most situations, when testosterone is given, it's given as only replacement therapy. So as, particularly when it's given as a gel, the goal is to maintain the testosterone level in the normal range. It's only when the levels of testosterone become too high or if, and that occurs, I say or, oh, and that occurs commonly with injectable testosterone. With injectable testosterone on day one or day two after that shot, the levels can be in the, above 1,000 and therefore erythrocytosis or too, much red, too many red blood cells are common with, trans, with injectable testosterone, but with transdermal testosterone, it's unlikely that that will occur, but it needs to be monitored. Okay, um, Joyce uh, asks about, um, well, she's str struggling with insurance, and insurance won't cover the androgel, so she's asking about uh, compounded testosterone, I presume a topical, and how that would compare in efficacy. Right, right. Well, I am not a fan of compound pharmacy. Uh, and, you know, I might get some people, angry people about this, but I think we've seen, sadly, most recently, a problem with meningitis um, for a, from, that came from a compound pharmacy. Now, I, 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 that's not to say that, you know, that was a very unique situation, but still, I think that an FDA-approved hormone that is made under the guidance of the FDA under good manufacturing procedures, GMP, is what is needed. So I, I do not prescribe um, compound in ho hormones at all because you have tons of FDA approved ones. You have about five or six on the market now and use them. And I don't find them any cheaper. Um, it, it turns out that uh, the um, uh, compound pharmacists are just, are just as expensive in, in many situations. So um, you really, it is, a, it is a problem with the insurance, I know that. And in that situation, most of my patients tend to go to injections because it's much cheaper. But I, I don't think that compound pharmacists in which you really don't know what the levels are or what the manufacturing procedures are um, would be the best alternative. Last question, um, and I think it's about uh, recreational drug use. Uh, the term self-medication was used here. So um, are there any studies that show uh, whether individuals who are on testosterone therapy versus those who are not um, have a better record related to uh, drug abuse? Um, drug abuse is not more common in men who are XXY versus, you know, XYs or versus, you know, it's, there's no relationship there. Um, and now are you talking about anabolic hormone abuse or are you talking about, you know, the typical things we think of drug abuse such as, you know, co cocaine and... Uh, well, I, you know what, I'm going to open uh, Didi's mic here because I think trying to do this typing would be too slow. So Didi, your mic is open and uh, she does type illegal drugs. So Didi, do you want to add anything? No. Okay, hearing none. She does, uh, she's typed no and indicated it did have to do with illegal drugs. Right, right. No data that there's more use, more illegal drug use. Uh, among XXYs than among XYs. Okay. Um, I am switching us over and um, going to show my screen. And uh, I want to uh, first mention to all those who are still here that there is a webinar coming up that, it, that may interest some of you. I want to bring it to your attention. That's the one with Dr. Schlegel uh, coming up in early December uh, on infertility treatment. And uh, this is the, uh, as uh, Dr. Dobbs mentioned, um, this is the, the center at uh, Weill Cornell Medical Center. Um, so these guys are uh, very focused on fertility. 
And with that said, I want to thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Um, this is absolutely terrific. This is uh, one of the best webinars we've ever had and extremely clear. Um, so I really appreciate it. And um, I apologize to the registrants, but I will post immediately following this meeting right here in this spot. I will post a link to the printouts, the, the handouts from Dr. Dobbs uh, PowerPoint. So you'll have printable copy of those slides, um, three per page for your note taking and uh, to, to remind you of the content. And this recording will be available um, in about a week, probably toward the end of next week. We should have this recording up on the website so you can come back and review it as often as you want. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Bye now.